and ideas and recommendations you might have for the next year's uh, experience. Now for a very special part of the program, I'd like to introduce three ambassadors to present the 2013 C3E Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, Marilyn Brown, who was our panelist. This morning, Sue Tierney, who is the managing principal at the Analysis Group. And uh, Mary Ann Sullivan, who is a partner uh, and energy lawyer at Hogan Lovells US. Together, they formed the committee that selected this year's winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award. With no further ado. You can imagine that with this committee, we had lots of nominations for the Lifetime Achievement Award. But I have to tell you that when Maxine Savitt's name was raised, we had an instant consensus. There was no debate. She has done it all. She has done government and policy. She has done science and technology. She's done the private sector, the public sector. And she has done all with great distinction. My principal role is to deliver the congratulations from Secretary Ernie Moniz, who under government ethics rules is not allowed to be here today, but you can tell that I'm not Ernie because my hair is slightly longer than his. <laughs> slightly. <laughs> but Maxine, I speak for Ernie, and I am sure I speak for everyone in the room when I tell you that his message to you is, I take great pleasure in extending congratulations to my friend and colleague, Maxine Savitz, on the occasion of her receiving the 2013 C3E Lifetime Achievement Award. She has had a distinguished career in industry, but my own associations with Maxine relate to her outstanding public service, advancing energy efficiency and energy technology innovation for nearly 40 years. Over the last few years, I've had the opportunity to work closely with Maxine as members of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, most especially on the PCAST task force that recommended approaches to accelerating energy technology innovation. This work led to President Obama's directive in his Climate Action Plan for a Quadrennial Energy Review a major undertaking to weave together the many threads of energy policy development. This is just one example of how Maxine has been a considerable force for clean energy and a wonderful colleague, too. I congratulate the C3E leaders and ambassadors for their outstanding choice of Maxine Savitz for the Lifetime Achievement Award, Ernest Moniz, Secretary of Energy. I've had the pleasure of knowing Maxine for several decades, and she, well, okay, that's all right, yeah, several. <laughs> She's just an extraordinary human being. She is not only brilliant as a scientist, she's wise, she is uh, more than anything generous. I served with Maxine on the Energy Foundation Board for a dozen years or something like that, and that was one example of the generosity that Maxine has shared with her community. Uh, she's done, she's been generous of her time and is actually, this is I think the, the message of importance I think for, for this particular conference. She's, she's not only given at her job, <laughs> she's not only given at her home, uh, but she's given to the community of people as a mentor, as a substantive contributor, as a very wise person. And uh, I think of her as very savvy uh, because she's just, uh, she has shepherded clean energy policy and materials development and innovation for so many years. So it's really my pleasure to be part of this team in congratulating her. And uh, last, I would like to offer also some hearty congratulations and a few anecdotes about the times that I have spent with Maxine over the past several decades. I like that, <laughs> that phraseology. 
Um, as Theodore Roosevelt said in 1903, far and away, the best prize that life offers is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. And I think that Maxine's career exemplifies that quote. I wanted to, in particular, highlight three areas of exceptional characteristics to highlight, even though really it could have gone on and on. Um, and the first one is your science and technology accomplishments. Sometimes they get overlooked because you've done so much recently. But when you look back to the 1980s and 90s, when you were working in materials science, you had a couple of significant breakthroughs. Mike Karnitz and Dave Stinton, off, Stinton from Oak Ridge offered this one as a, as a good example. Um, the development of silicon nitride for high temperature applications. While you were at Allied Signal, um, you led an effort that successfully developed a monolithic silicon nitride uh, for small gas turbine engine auxiliary equipment uh, to achieve greater energy efficiency and one of the Department of Energy's key goals for that large program. Um, so the next time you are sitting on a runway in a commercial aircraft and you begin to feel, you know, that refrigerated feeling that comes through and you, you know, reach up to <laughs> turn off the, the spigot, <laughs> you can think at least it's being produced very efficiently. <laughs> Thanks to Maxine Savitz. Um, Mike also asked me uh, to remember the pleasure he had spending time with your husband, Alan. And this is sort of a segue to um, Maxine's second characteristic. Mike mentioned that when you guys went to very big events all over the world on gas turbine research, that you would work the room. <laughs> and Mike had the opportunity to spend time with Alan. And so Maxine's networking skills are exceptional. I would like her Rolodex, please. <laughs> it is the envy. It is awesome. Uh, I came to know Maxine in the 1980s when she was on the advisory committee of the High Temperature Materials Lab at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and I was just a junior there. <clears throat> what she did each year, um, she'd get me on the phone, she'd say, does Kathy Vaughn or Penny Humphreys have their uh, budget spreadsheet ready yet? You might know that the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy program has one of the most detailed budget write-ups, markups, of any program in the world, I think. And so it was quite an accomplishment. And, and so Maxine would take this, and she would spin a story about every single line explaining the ups and downs of the markups. So this was back when there'd be a presidential um, budget, <clears throat> proposed budget, then the House would mark up and the Senate would mark up and then the differences would be reconciled in a conference committee. So that's at least four numbers that you've got to look at. And so she would work her way through that budget. You know, this is a long lost art because I don't think we get to conference very often anymore. <laughs> Still, uh, I relied on Maxine to know the inside story. <clears throat> and the culmination of my Hill training under Maxine occurred with several uh, meetings that she arranged for the two of us with Loretta Beaumont. You might remember lunches on the Hill. Loretta Beaumont was the um, principal staffer of Energy and Water Resources for many years, a very powerful woman, and the whole um, series of meetings exemplified girl power, I have to tell you. <laughs> So um, moving on to the third attribute I wanted to highlight, that's your ability to motivate. Um, Bob Fry labels you one of America's great public scientists because you have the ability to weave an integrated story about why an investment in some deep scientific program, the technical details all embellished, uh, in combination with some policies to assist their market penetration would be a great investment for the U.S. Congress to make. Um, you're able to tell people why it is that past investments have, been, have produced such great payoff. And you did this very well in um, your co-chaired, co-authored report, Energy Efficiency, um, Was It Worth It? 
which ends up uh, being one of the National Academy's best-selling energy reports. I quote it all the time. So you uh, have excelled there. I had the privilege of working with you on several National Academy committees and reports, and I can tell you how hard Maxine works. But at the same time, she gets everybody else to work just as hard. She galvanizes and motivates because she's always telling us how important we are and how important this work is. So your ability to stimulate a whole wrath of effort uh, for the things you love is a real accomplishment. This Lifetime Achievement Award is so very well deserved. To come up. ballet of <laughs> walking and sitting and yeah Tina Van Sickle and Adam Savitz are going to say a few words um, before we let Maxine take over the mic. Great. Thank you so much. It's a it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, talking about Maxine. Uh, she was a huge transformation transforming individual in my life. Um, I first met her when she was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Conservation. As you heard, that's the federal office to do R&D for these wonderful energy efficient technologies. <clears throat> when I went to interview her, I was absolutely amazed at the tasks and the activities that she conducted because her office essentially was Grand Central Station of policy formulation and execution on these technologies. So like others, I was a rookie. I came into the interview. I said, you know, knowing what she was doing, the congressional oversight, uh, budget, and so on, I had to admit that, in fact, uh, I knew nothing about 90% of what she needed me to do. So she said, not to worry, you'll learn. And in fact, I did. On any working day, I would have 20 to 25 packages that were in some state of coordination, either interagency, personnel, uh, authorization committee oversight, appropriations, all getting input from the programs, all needing to go somewhere else by a certain time. And usually, it was a very short deadline. Uh, but it was a fabulous working relationship. And I echo what everybody else has said, that as a motivator, there's just nobody else like Maxine. So as a, as a mentee, how did that work? What was, that, what was it like as a special assistant? Well, it was by absorption. She's a huge role model, passionate advocate, absolutely stellar with her program people, open door policy, absolutely inclusive, and as has been alluded before, nobody can absorb more information <clears throat> in a time period and act on it more decisively than Maxine Savitz. So that was absolutely a fabulous time. She was totally generous uh, giving to me on uh, how it all was put together. Uh, other parts of this mentoring ship could take the form of mentoring by nudge. And that meant that you would be sent to do a task that was beyond your comfort zone, but that essentially would be good for you and would be good for her. So I remember, Tina, why don't you go uh, be a loan guarantee, get these clearances through the department? And I would say, great, Maxine, what's a loan guarantee? <laughs> and she'd say, well, you will learn. And, 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 indeed, I, <laughs> and indeed, I did. A, a major mentoring activity that she did for me was a, a true nudge, and that was up to the, an opening on the House Science Committee. Um, I took that opening, and it began unbeknownst to me at the time, 
a 10-year-long relationship working for and with the Science Committee to spread the numbers, do authorizations, uh, do the uh, oversight activities, hearings, and so on, to promote these hugely valuable technologies. And today, you just see uh, how they've transformed, how they're growing, where it's all leading. So in that regard, I want to thank her for myself. But like others, I want to thank her for her work with all of us over this wonderful, wonderful career of advocacy and leadership. Thank you, Maxine. And thank you for letting me speak. Hi, I'm Adam Savitz. I'm Maxine's um, son. So my perspective is a little different. It's not easy to introduce someone um, as accomplished as my mother and as someone that I've known for almost 50 years at this point. Um, the first, first point uh, with clean energy is thinking about the impact that energy conservation had in my life growing up in the 1970s. Um, my mother had excellent timing in joining the Department of Interior where energy policy was just before the first oil embargo and then progressing through the alphabet soup of federal agencies dealing with energy matters. During this period of time, she also took conservation home. Our house had stickers to remind us to turn off the lights, to turn down the thermostat. In 1975, we bought probably the ugliest American car of all times, which was one of the first compact cars. So you know, we, we learned energy conservation at home, and to this day, my sister and I are aware of this. We both drive Priuses as our primary vehicle, so that's had an impact on our life, being aware of these matters. I think another area is in the intellectual and professional pursuits um, with a focus on equity, equality, and public focus. Both my father and my mother instilled the importance of academic pursuits, but also with a focus on practical matters, um, having something that's going to be important for people and for society. In the 70s, it was very unusual to have a dual professional, to have two professionals as parents. Um, there was a strong emphasis, sort of an assumption, that women can do anything, um, that there was really no Nothing that men could do or women could do is just sort of a, a equality there that we grew up with. Um, but there was also an attempt at finding a work-life balance. After she left the government in the early 80s, um, my mom didn't take an industry job in California um, until my sister graduated from high school a couple years later. So finding that balance is very hard. It's very hard for all of us who attempt to do that. Um, with the concept of sort of a gender blind, anyone can do anything that they work hard at, that they put themselves to, um, has served me very well professionally, has made it, you know, for me to encourage people, both um, male and female students who've worked with me, um, as well as my children really growing up um, incorporating feminist um, ideals into every part of their lives. Um, the focus on the professional pursuits has had, with sort of a societal a benefit for the community, um, has happened for my sister and myself. We're both physicians. My sister is a surgeon. I'm a research psychiatrist. And this has continued on to the next generation with my children being interested in helping others in public policy, foreign relations. So my family and I are very proud of my mother for all of her past and current accomplishments, and we want to congratulate her on this Lifetime Achievement Award. Just amazing, and I really want to thank uh, 
uh, everybody in this uh, audit, uh, who are here today. I want to thank uh, the uh, C3E uh, uh, Award Committee, the ambassadors, all them, and all of you are here. Uh, I'm very pleased and uh, very honored. And it was sort of uh, all the five people you heard from. Well, there were four decades from which I was working in the energy area, and then my son, who spanned all of them, it was sort of gets a decadal type of uh, thing. But I also want to congratulate all the award winners here uh, uh, today. You have accomplished wonderful things in your mid-career and will uh, continue to uh, do that. And it's just wonderful to see the younger people uh, here who, and also all the women. Uh, somebody, Amy made a comment, well, there were more women here than when she was a student uh, uh, here. When I started in the clean energy area, you wouldn't have gotten 200 men or women together at that area. And the women were clearly on, on the handful, as uh, uh, Tina would uh, remember. And I sang last night at dinner, um, and education really is very important to me, to everyone that, that I uh, come in contact with, my children and, and all. And when I did my graduate work here 50 years ago, there were 30 women in the entire graduate school and 30 women in the undergraduate school out of 6,000 people. And said some, two people have said to me when I said that, well, that's just crazy. Well, that's what it was in the turn of the 50s and early 60s. We were 1% of the population. And now, 50 years later, it's 45% of the undergraduate school are women, close to 2,000 people, and over 30% of uh, the uh, uh, graduate students. And there's been a woman president. There are women chairman of department. And last year, Min Millie Dresselhaus, who was a real trailblazer here, won the Lifetime Achievement Award. So people have come, but there's still much work to do. And, uh, and continue to say education. Another congratulation I want to do because this, Bo this is Boston and it is Massachusetts, but just this week, the American Council of Energy uh, and Economy uh, uh, ranked 34 cities and published that Boston was number one in energy saving policies. Next month will come out the state uh, 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 rankings. We don't know what they were, but for the last two years, it was Massachusetts. So clearly, all of you who live and work here in the various fields, both Boston and, and the state, should be well complimented to that you are leading the nation in, uh, in uh, clean, clean energy uh, that you have to do. Well, in addition to education being important, I think, you know, and many, many of these have come up uh, in the course of the day, People are really the most important thing. I mean, having good people, networking uh, with people, uh, collaborating with people. Uh, things don't happen when you don't have good people working with you, and you want the best. And uh, you can always judge somebody as to do they pick the best talented people to work with them and, and really make those, those accomplishments. The other thing is having a passion for what you do and that you, you really are committed, uh, have the persistence to see that it goes through. And, and those just carry, carry you along. And, it, and, it's, and it's helped by all these things coming together, particularly when you're working with people and working with interesting opportunities. And I, one of the other things is being flexible with what you want to do. The, and so if opportunity comes, I mean, clean energy didn't exist 40 and 50 years ago. It really uh, started at the oil and bar, a little few Years before the oil embargo, people started to, in this, and that was it's going to be 40 years this uh, next month, that uh, the uh, people didn't know where, how much energy was used to, in a building, how much energy was used to, uh, to drive a car many miles per gallon. We had plenty of energy. It was after World War II. Uh, there were all sorts of, uh, it was low, and very low, 25 cents a gallon. And, uh, there, and we were producing a, a lot. It, they started to do some work at National Science Foundation, had an applied program, which I was fortunate enough to work with uh, an economist there to start looking at uh, what things look like. Then came October of, uh, at the end of October of uh, 71, 73, and many of you would not have remembered it. You weren't sitting in gas lines. Your parents will have remembered it. But also at that point, electricity had a lot of its generation came from oil. It was not less than 4% as it is now. I live in Los Angeles now, but at that point, 
uh, Los Angeles Water and Power had 50% of its uh, electricity coming from oil plants. And they had just signed an agreement with the Middle East. And so they were without power. So the government was really, the World Trade Center had just opened, used as much electricity as the city of Schenectady. I mean, when you, just, when you think of these numbers, just incredible. And no one was concerned about it until the time we were limited in energy. And when that happened, if you were at the right place at the right time, and I was very fortunate, you could issue a policy statement and it would be read the next day by the president. And so the government in the summer of 73 had started to save and look for ways to save energy. Again, this is before the embargo as a way to save money. And one of it was lighting restrictions and heating and cooling. So some of us felt, well, we'll just ask the private sector to uh, reduce their lighting levels the same as the government was doing. And it got announced by, uh, it was Frank Zarb, the head of uh, one of the Alphabet Soup Energy Groups. Well, the next day I was in his office along with the heads of GE, of Westinghouse, and Sylvania's lighting divisions, because they said we're going to put them out of business. We didn't talk to them. And uh, you know what were we going to do? Well, I, there were several things that we learned from that. One, they went, continued to go on. And as you saw in the, one of the panels from uh, this morning, the lighting has really moved. We've got now LEDs, which is just revolutionary and very exciting. But you learn to work with people. I mean, I had a very fast lesson that you don't do things without talking to them first. And you don't have to do what they say, but at least you do talk to them and you try to collaborate. But you know, even though we had partnerships, we still went on to develop compact fluorescent lights at that time. Uh, even though the industry didn't want to do it, we had some small businesses who did. And then they then became more ubiquitous. Uh, and so you can do it. And it was one, and one of the... Uh, Things, uh, Tina, I think our men Marilyn mentioned uh, 22 years R&D, was it worth it? That was one of the big return on investments along with solid state ballast and uh, e-windows that the government funded in the 70s that have led to real market penetration and continues to be helpful and improved by a standard such as the refrigerator and technology. So it's just all these things working together and taking advantage of things at, at the time that you may not predict, but also the people. That really does make, make a difference. And I want to just end by saying it's, just, it's not just the people you work with, but your family and, and it's the support and, um, and that I have gotten from my family. It's just been uh, terrific. I had a, uh, my husband, Alan, who uh, we have a lot of MIT connections who passed away uh, seven years ago. We had a very good uh, relationship. He graduated from here as an uh, undergraduate. You've seen Adam. His, he's the only one who didn't have some MIT connection, so we let him speak today. <laughs> uh, and uh, my daughter, who is a physician, but also she, did, she got her uh, MBA at the Sloan School here uh, uh, in 1999. And, um, and then my brother-in-law, who's here, uh, Elliot, was here as an undergraduate. We had lunches. He said that used to be where you had your meals, and my sister-in-law here. And then my two of my grandchildren, one of one who looked at MIT today, and uh, daughter. So it's been, the support of family is just terrific, and the support of all the people around. And again, I want to thank all of you, and uh, I want to thank you all for being here and for doing the work you're doing. In addition to having the passion and the persistence, have fun. And that's what you're spending a lot of time. Many, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you for all the members of Maxine's family who came here. I know what it's like to occasionally come to the stage and the people that you love the most and you really actually would like to have there are usually not there because it doesn't work. So I'm just really so glad that they can be here and enjoy this moment with you. Um, and there are many in the room that, that uh, really draw tremendous